My name is Ryan. I grew up in London. Uh, not that London, this London. <laughs> I moved there when I was in fifth grade, and within two years, my only goal in life was getting the fuck out of that town. You know, it was small, not only in size, but in mentality. It was conservative, it was traditional, it was just nothing that I, that I wanted. So I, I was really lucky. I had an older brother who introduced me to the Misfits and Black Flag and Dead Kennedys and the Ramones when I was really young. And what that music did, you know, in addition to kind of inspiring me over the years, it got me in with a bunch of really interesting kids in high school, uh, in the, you know, as I moved into high school. Kids that just didn't give a shit, had nothing to lose. Kids that came from really rough backgrounds, you know, who never lived up to their potential due to a lot of things that cause people to not live up to their potential, like rough families and drugs and alcohol. Uh, and so, but the music itself, it, it taught us that it was okay to step out. It was okay to be different. It was okay to try new things and kind of create a new space that you weren't judged in and that you could be yourself. So when I was 17, I had mediocre grades and really no interest in college. Even if I had wanted to go to college, I don't think I could have gotten into one. I'd been playing music and, and, and recording music kind of on my own for a while, and I decided, fuck it, I'm going to go do that for a living. I'm going to be a recording engineer. So I looked up schools. I found three. One in London, obviously out of the question. One in Toronto, and if you know Canadian geography at all, it's not very far away from London, so scratch that one off. And the last one I found in a guitar magazine was in Los Angeles. And as a 17-year-old kid in that shitty town, LA was like, oh my god, I have to do that. And so I did the only reasonable thing a 17-year-old would do. I took all the savings I had uh, from working at a crappy inventory job. I told my parents, you can't stop me. And I got on a Greyhound bus and I went to LA to see the school. It just seemed like the only thing I could do. You know, it was 1994, it wasn't like I could look up their Yelp reviews. They didn't have a website. You know, I couldn't see if my Facebook friends knew anyone that went there. So I figured I just had to go there. And I had no idea what the outcome would be. You know, I had never even traveled without my parents. But I knew I had to get away. I had to create some new space for some new experience. And to me, that's sort of the, the essence of what punk rock is, what the music is. And so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is from one of my favorite bands, Fugazi, from a couple of records, but a lot of the stuff is from this record. Um, and so I'm going to, and I have a little story about it. This came out in, in 1990, I believe. Uh, and when I was 15, it just hit me like a brick. And over the years, what's been amazing about this music is the meaning has changed as I've changed. You know, when I was 15, I was angry with the world, my parents and everything, and I connected with that idea of you know, doing something different, being on your own, having uh, that kind of like, integrity and principles. But even now, as I work at a really big company, all those same messages mean something completely different to me. And that's a lot of what I'm going to share with you today, what those messages and those lyrics mean to me in that context. And I hope that some of it uh, is, is somewhat interesting. So I'm going to start off by talking about what is punk. And so I watched a great interview with Ian from Fugazi, who talked about punk. And I think he got the first part for me right. He said, punk's not a fashion or an attitude or a music you know, uh, or a sound. Every generation has its own counterculture. And that counterculture always looks and sounds and acts differently. What punk is, is the free space for new ideas without being dictated to by profit. Free from tradition, free from judgment, free from rules. It's that free and open space. And that sounds a lot like you know, if, you, if I was here to do a talk on innovation, that same kind of idea. And so it reminded me of a quote from Jonathan Ive when he spoke at, uh, spoke at Steve Jobs' eulogy about the fragility of ideas. He said, well, ideas are ultimately so powerful, they start off as fragile, half-formed things, um, so easily compromised, so easily missed, so easily just squished. And to me, what punk rock is, is a mix of people being so sick of the current situation, being so sick of the status quo, that they're willing to take action mixed with those, that free space where new ideas can be created, and running with those new ideas and being strong enough to not be afraid to push them. 
And so this is a quote from uh, uh, an interview uh, where they're asking Ian about the lyrics for Minor Threat. So when I listened to Minor Threat, it just was this uh, call against society. You know, I felt that Ian was yelling at the world. And when they asked him about it, he said he actually wasn't writing songs to tell the world. He was writing songs to tell his friends. He was in the punk scene in DC, but he wasn't like the other punk kids. He didn't drink, he didn't do drugs, he didn't smoke, he shaved his head. And so he wrote about his world, and he tried to change his world. And what ended up happening was that change rippled beyond his control into, the, into all of the world, and people from all over the world have been influenced and enjoyed those messages. And so at work, I feel the same way. It's often overwhelming to think of uh, the huge problems that a lot of us try to go after and face, even in whether that's an internal problem or an external problem. But what I find is when I focus on the space around me, the world around me, and that's what I try to change, and that's what I try to adjust and push, that then that allows the momentum to build and can get bigger over time. Um, this is a song uh, called Blueprint, so the line is, what a difference a little difference can make. And this kind of, for me, ties into the last thought, where I think, you know, it, it lets me remember that I don't need to do something big in order for big things to happen. You know, big change can happen with little differences over long periods of time, or little differences over large groups of people. And so I always try to focus on how can I make a small difference a lot? And how can I always be trying to make little differences? And over time, they become much bigger. Uh, I notice this a lot in golf. I play golf, which I know is not like a very punk thing to play. <laughs> Golf's a great example of that, where the difference between something amazing happening and something terrible happening is like this. It's like this little shift. It's a little movement in your posture or a little tiny thing. It's these little differences that can grow into big differences when you repeat them. And in that same way, little differences sometimes take a long time to mean anything. And so this always reminds me that you have to really keep pushing. You can't give up. You know, there's so many people that try something and it doesn't work the first time and they kind of give up. So many businesses were ahead of the game in certain areas. I work at Microsoft. We were ahead on a lot of things. and We didn't do anything with it and now we're behind because people give up if the time isn't right. And you have to remember, at least what I try to always remember is, if I'm onto something that I think is interesting, I focus on creating that space around me with the people around me in my world to make it happen, and I am patient. I push and push and push until eventually it happens. Um, this next thing I think is something that I feel I have to always remind myself of. Uh, and a lot of it comes from, you know, the, earlier today there was a talk where they talked about uh, it was some, some of the lines of like impo imposter per, uh, personality problem or something like that. The idea was that people feel like they're an imposter, that they're going to get found out at any moment, that you know, I don't, I'm not really qualified to do this, even if I'm good at it, because I was lucky enough to get here. Uh, and, I, and I feel that a lot, especially with a lot of the kids I grew up with. And at work, and especially you know, in the current tech business that we're in right now, there's so much, we have so much. There's so much privilege everywhere. You forget how much that impacts you. You know, how many people here have read uh, Rich Kids of Instagram, the Tumblr? So basically, it's a Tumblr of a guy that follows a bunch of rich kids who post pictures on Instagram of them on planes, them like on, in Greek islands, them spending, you know, $150,000 at a bar. And this is all happening on Instagram. And, and you read it and you think, oh, this is insane. These people are crazy. But then I think a lot of times I remind myself that to 90% of the world, we're the rich kids of Instagram. Right? Our photos are, are the same kind of difference in, in where they're at. Uh, and so I always feel like I have to remind myself that I'm so lucky where I am that I, I don't take it for granted. And I think what helps me do that is a, a line from Repeater. It's another amazing song on that same record. Where he says, once upon a time I had a name and way, but to you I'm nothing but a number. I feel that, you know, I feel this in my company a lot is, when you get hired at a place, you often get hired because of who you are or what you've done, which to me is like your name and your way. But big companies, or, or even medium companies, they need to manage risk. And so they naturally start to homogenize the workforce so that if you were to disappear one day or go off somewhere else, the place wouldn't fall apart. They could slot someone in and replace you. 
right? And what ends up happening is you start to lose your identity in the system. You start to forget your name and your way. And then you actually become a number. And the irony of that is that, uh, you know, you become replaceable by following along. And so for me, I always try to remember my name and my way, where I came from, how I got here. And I think for me, that's such a powerful way to avoid the privilege. And I think we all build products and services and things for the world, yet we don't live in the world. We live in this other fake world that we've created. And especially if you're at a big company, everything is taken care of for you. They give you laundry. They drive you around on buses with Wi-Fi. You just don't connect with the world around you. And this reminds me that that's the most important thing to create something amazing is to be connected to that world and not forget my name and my way. Another good story from this that, that I just reminded of in my notes, uh, there was a great article in The New Yorker about the Cirque du Soleil uh, with one of the recruiters who talked about how they hire talent for the shows that they do. And they have this really unique problem where they need some amazing, talented people to create these shows that that people watch and think, how did they do that? But they also can't have someone that's too unique and talented because then the entire show is based off that person's expertise. And if they want to have the show go to multiple cities, or they want the show to run for two years, or if that person gets upset and leaves, the entire show falls apart. And so they're always trying to pick people that are awesome but replaceable. And I think that's the modus operandi of all big companies. And that's your ability to get away from that and push back on that is what makes you not replaceable and gives you more power back. Um, this is from a song called Facet Squared. So what this reminds me of is, I feel like it's so easy to become complacent uh, and coast. I think I know that I look at broken things all day. Whenever I see the world, especially technically, I always see things that aren't the way they should be, that are broken, that are not working. And many of those things I can't change. But that attitude, once it gets into your head, makes you start to think the same thing about things you can change. And you just start coasting and going along for things. And you have to remember that that's not what gets you moving forward. So this is another, this is actually probably, there's two of my favorite lyrics that I have today. This is my second favorite. The first favorite's a little later. Uh, Never mind what's been selling, it's what you're buying. This to me was like, I feel like at work, you have a ton of BS. In life, you have a ton of BS. Walk outside and see all the crazy people with their signs and their stupid giveaway bullshit outside. It's just stuff is coming at you all the time, right? And oftentimes, I have a lot of friends who didn't come to South by Southwest this year because they said, it's over, it's too big, it's bullshit, it's just full of corporate stuff. And that's, that's ridiculous. You know, I feel as it's gotten bigger, it's gotten better because there's so much good stuff, I've got a choice. And it's my choice to decide, what am I going to buy? What am I going to go do? What am I going to be associated with? I don't give a shit what everyone else is selling. I don't care if the street's full of that stuff. You can always go find interesting things. And I think it's important, at least for me, to, to remind myself that it's always in my power what I control and what uh, can, people around me are. Like, my world is within my power. This is from a song called Lockdown. The quote is, because a business is as business does. And to me, what it, what it says is, you know, everyone talks about what their business is. Everyone has press releases. Everyone has a message that they want the world to understand. But none of that matters. What matters is what the business actually does, the actions it takes. And so for me, I have to remind myself that every day it's my job to hold the business and hold the teams and hold myself to that standard. That it doesn't matter what we write, that doesn't make it any better. It's about what we act and what we, how we do and what we do. You know, and I think what that does for me is it reminds me that I have the capability to change it, even in a small way, that hopefully will grow into a larger way. And this kind of caps off with, you know, don't say you're along for the ride, sitting down when you should stand. I think, again, like I said before, over time you acclimatize to a situation. You get used to it and you stop realizing that it's, it's changed into something that you don't like anymore. And once you've been coasting and sitting there for a while, it's really hard to get the momentum to stand back up. And so I always think to myself, am I sitting down right now? Am I along for the ride right now? How, what can I do that's small right now to get out of that state and start making progress in the way that I want? Because it's up to me. 
This one, I think, is from a song called Merchandise. It's, we owe you nothing and you have no control. To me, I think a lot of people, and myself included, get stuck in this feeling where we owe somebody something. Whether that's we're lucky for where we got or we had people along the way that have helped us with opportunities and helped us do things. And we become beholden to them. We think, you know, we have to go along with things for much longer than we'd like to because we owe them something. And what I've found is most people who have helped me, they don't want me to feel that way. They don't want me to feel like if I, I owe them. They, they gave me that opportunity because it made them feel good and they thought I deserved it. And I have to remind myself that I'm doing a disservice to myself and them by thinking that way. You know? And so I say this a lot. I said it when I, before I came in the room. I say it in my head before I go into a performance review or a meeting. I keep that in my mind at all times, that I don't owe anyone anything. No one has control over me. I have the ability to make what I want to happen happen. I think this is another line from a song called Filler that helps me is, so many things are in her head. I was incredibly nervous before I walked in here. That's why I play music usually before I do a talk, because it calms me down a little bit. Uh, plus, it also means you know when it's going to start, because the music stops. You don't have to see me like standing here, kind of awkwardly waiting to start. But I have to remind myself that, that inner critic, that nervous energy that's with me all the time, it's just in my head. It doesn't matter. I don't have to listen to it. Right? I don't have to follow what, it, what it's telling me to do. And just the recognition of that helps me a lot. Um, it also reminds me that I don't have to fight every battle. I don't have to do everything. So many of the things that I perceive as a problem aren't actually problems. And again, I think it goes back to that privilege comment is we have so much, but we're humans. And so we have to complain about things. That's just a natural part of who we are. So if we have a lot of stuff, we'll complain about stupid shit, right? And I do it all the time. You know, like I'll get upset if the Wi-Fi breaks on our company bus. Like this is bullshit. How am I supposed to do anything? There's no Wi-Fi. And you realize this is, it's, it's ridiculous, right? And I always run it, it's in your head, it's in your head. This is not you know, who you are. This is my favorite line. I have it tattooed on my chest, because it means a lot to me. Uh, you, are, you are not what you own. And so, for a lot of my time growing up, it really represented you know, not being materialistic. And I think that it's a very valid explanation of it, and that's probably close to what Ian was talking about. But at work, I find it has a whole different power. You know, at work, we're always given a set of things to do. And most people, when they get those things, those become their blinders. And they focus on that. And they try to do a great job at that. And they don't look at the entire business or the entire product or the entire world and go, what's the most important thing that I should be doing? How can I help the most? So what I'm always reminded of with this is, I'm not what I've owned. I'm not what's been assigned to me at work. I can do whatever I want, whatever I think is most important. And I'm empowered to go do that, even if someone tells me not to. Um, this is a, a quote that randomly has been sticking in my head for like four months, and so I put it up here. If, you, if you're a big Fugazi fan, you may know that there is not a song called My French Uncle. That's actually from my French uncle. Uh, and, and I don't know whether... This was a translation error, like he was trying to tell me something else, because he's not very good with English. Uh, but when he said to me, rules are meant to be known, something just triggered, and I thought, that's a really interesting way to think about rules. Not are they meant to be broken, not are they meant to be followed, but they're meant to be known. And once you know them, you can decide what you're going to do, and, and how you're going to work around them and work with them, if you need to. And then it reminded me of a, a talk I saw recently at work, where Chi Lu is, runs our, our Bing team. And he, he said a, a manager gave him some great advice once that said, gee, you know, you have to always think, is this a rule or is this a guideline? If it's a rule, you probably have to do it. Like, you can't punch someone in the face at work. Even if they piss you off, you can't punch them in the face. It's a rule. But everything else, most things that seem like rules aren't rules. They're just guidelines. They're just something someone set up once because they thought that's what people should do. Uh, and he said, ignore guidelines. Do whatever the hell you want. Just don't break rules. And for me, that's been really interesting because I've always asked that question now. Whenever I come up against something that I think is ridiculous, I ask myself, is that a rule or is that a guideline? If it's a guideline, well, it doesn't mean anything. I can go do something else and create a new guideline. I can go break it. It's not important. Um, this one's from a Minor Threat song. And so it says, we don't care, we don't pose. We'll steal your money, we'll steal your shows. 
I think, again, a lot of times, I've had, you know, on the way down here, I had conversations in the cab with some people that I met, and people have this need to give what they're working on, what they're doing, this big sense of importance. And they'll go on and on about their company and their social media thing and all the stuff they're doing and how amazing it is and all their customers. People that kick ass don't pose. They just do shit. They don't talk about it before they do it. They just go there and go and get, get it done. There was a great quote that, uh, from an interview Bill Gates did in the 90s where they were asking about what he thought of, uh, of Steve Jobs going back to Apple. And he said, I don't know why Steve keeps trying. He can't win. Right? And it didn't seem to me that Steve was trying to pose or talk about it. He came back and just kicked ass. He put out stuff that was awesome, and then that's what changes the shift of things. If you're really trying to create an impression, you always end up kind of looking bad. It's advice I sometimes would give to my CEO. Okay, next. Oh, sweet. Well, time for questions, and you'll get to leave early. Okay. So this is the, the last little quote before I do a little summary. Uh, and this is, for me, like the most important quote of all of it. Uh, it says, don't get tangled up trying to be free. And so for me, for me, that means is, yes, I want to try and live into these principles. I want to try and do the best that I can. But you can't take everything so fucking seriously. You've got you to gotta admit that you're human, right? You're, you're going to fuck up. Uh, you, what you really want to do, and what I try to do, is you enjoy the journey. You don't worry about the outcome. You enjoy the journey that the principles of the things you believe in take you on. And then you don't get tangled up. So the first night I got to LA, I stayed at a Westo LA hotel room. Uh, I heard gunshots for the first time. Being Canadian, you don't hear gunshots ever unless you hunt, which I don't hunt. So, uh, and I thought to myself, what the fuck did I do? Why, why did I come here? This was a giant mistake. But the next three weeks, after moving down to Santa Monica by the beach in a nicer motel, uh, really changed my life. You know, I woke up here in the ocean for the first time. I took a bus all over Los Angeles. I got a tour of that school. And I realized something. You know, it, I can do anything. I can go start to learn how to code, and I code, but terribly. So don't ask me to code, but I can't. I can start a business. I can go work at a big company like Microsoft without a college degree. And so that's the kind of uh, you know, message that I want to send, is that you know, the, the free space where you go to experiment and do new things, it may be fragile. It may be not fully formed. But it's the people that can refuse to be missed, can refuse to compromise, and can refuse to be squished. And to me, that's punk rock. So I think all of you should go out today and be fucking punk rock. Thank you. <laughs>